Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. So honored to be here. This is um, an exciting uh, moment for me, and it's an exciting moment for your country. And it occurred to me this year, I've been in the UK, I've been in Cuba, and now I've been in Colombia. Probably three of the most interesting countries on the world stage this year. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the nation's branding. And we know as when you go to the polls on October 2nd to make some very big decisions about the future of your country, you'll also be making very big decisions about the future of your country brand, your reputation in the world. And that's what we're going to talk about to begin with. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've done measuring countries as brands in the eyes of the world. And then we'll look at uh, data on Colombia. But most importantly, we want to have a discussion on what you think if we were advertising for Colombia being the brand manager for this great country, how would we look at this data and what should we do with it? So let's get right into it. So first of all, country branding, this is not a new idea. There have been famous countries around for many, many years. But what's interesting is that we see there's new ways to measure the value of a country brand. We'll talk about this as we get in and look at the data. First of all, I'm from BAB, which is part of Young and Rubicam, Person, Marsteller, and Wonderman, and we measure brands all over the world. We talk to consumers, 50,000 consumers across 50 countries. We have all kinds of data that we can use to understand how uh, brands are perceived in the minds of consumers. But what we did recently is we went out and we asked 16,000 people, 16,000 elites, um, opinion leaders, business people, and ordinary citizens, ordinary consumers. We asked them to rate 60 different countries across the world on 75 different measures. So some of these are advertising measures, like this country is cool or it's trendy. Some are very, very specific. Like I believe this country has a well-educated population or cares about human rights. Now what we did is we went and looked out to understand how countries are perceived as brands. But importantly, what does the ideal nation look like? And how could we learn from each other, right? Rather than thinking in one way, what are the things that we can learn from different countries and how they're perceived? So we surveyed countries, as I mentioned, um, 60 different nations. There's a number of countries from Latin America that's in our data. And I want to start first with the results. And this part is perhaps the most important, so I will focus on how the model works. The first thing is that all of this data is perception. Okay, it's not actual fact. It's how people think about a certain country. What we learned that was very interesting to us is that there are three important clusters of perceptions that determine whether or not your country's GDP will grow. These three that were the most important were number one, entrepreneurship. This had nearly a 20% explanatory factor in terms of GDP. This is whether your country has a skilled labor force, whether it's connected to the rest of the world, whether it's seen as innovative, entrepreneurial, and whether it is seen as having technology and well-developed legal. These are sort of the things that start to give the country a reputation of being innovative. Secondly, though, and equally importantly, was quality of life. Now today, Leadership in a country is dependent on whether or not you care about human rights, whether you're preparing your nation to make it safe, to make it accessible, to make it more inclusive. So quality of life was equally important at 19%. And lastly, citizenship, whether your country is a global citizen, not just caring about your country's issues, but actually caring about the broader global world from the environment to social justice. Now, if you think about it, those three together created almost 
of the explanatory value in creating future GDP. This is so important because these three are something that we call soft power. So instead of banks and tanks and how big a country is and how rich it is, it was more about its feminine values. Whether it cares for its people, whether it cares for the world, and whether it's doing this through innovation. So this becomes very important because you can see traditional power only explained 8% of the value. So we're gonna look at all the rankings through this lens and you'll see why certain countries, such as Germany, did so well. So Germany was our number one country this year in the data. And if you go back to that, that previous chart, you could see it was because of Germany having soft power, being strong on immigration, taking a leadership position in the world on trying to solve the Euro crisis. We also see that Canada was number two. Canada is not a large country, but in our data was hugely influential, seen as a modern leadership country. You can also see that many of the Nordic countries that had very progressive values on caring for their citizens, as well as on human rights and global citizenship also did well. Spain and Brazil were also in the top 20, and we're going to talk in just a few moments about how Colombia was perceived overall in the data. So we presented all of this at Davos, at the World Economic Forum in January. And we were complementing this with all the rankings that you can see through our two partners. We did this research with the Wharton School, as well as US News and World Report. And all this data is up for free on the US News website. It's called US News uh, Best Countries. We also created an ebook as well that you can download if you're interested. That's also free. But we got a lot of press. Uh, we got really good coverage all over the world about the rankings and the systems. Uh, and we got a funny video too as well. Let me share that with you briefly. You guys can play the video. Many important topics to cover tonight, not the least of which is something called the Best Countries Report. This is a ranking of all the top countries in the world. It's determined by a group that includes the Wharton School of Business and U.S. News and World Report. They released their findings at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland today, and according to them, the best country in the world is... Anyone? Germany! First, Steve Harvey said Colombia, and everyone got his <laughs> Germany is the best country in the world. Germany came in first, Canada was second, the United Kingdom ranked third, and we checked in after that. The United States finished fourth. I'll tell you what, when Donald Trump finds out about this, he is uh, <laughs> going to sell a lot more hats, that's for sure. <laughs> How do we get beat by Germany? We have movie stars, we have Disneyland, we have Costco. They, they have this. This is, I think this is their president. That's their leader. His name is Hosen. Anyway, congratulate. So, we, we love Jimmy Kimmel in the U.S. I don't know if you guys uh, have seen Jimmy Kimmel on, on the web. He's a yeah. talk show host. Um, but we got a lot of press, um, and importantly, many of the world leaders such as the Prime Minister's uh, office in Canada sent out tweets. The German uh, uh, Prime Minister's office uh, sent out uh, information as well. So we got a lot of good press and we were excited about it. The Germans were really funny. They said, congratulations to Germany for winning the best country. Soon we will be number one in humor also. <laughs> so the important thing about all this uh, coverage is we started to create a discussion about policy. Many governments don't think like advertising people and marketing people, right? They think about policies and their constituents. But everything you do impacts your brand. We know that as brand marketers, right? If we make a bad product or we have a bad service, that's gonna show up in our brand image. What we're trying to do is bring Madison Avenue into the Beltway, into where leadership happens so that 
they can begin to think like marketers. Now, there's a lot of other things you can see on the US News website, because we partnered with journalists to really unpack stories that were behind the rankings, including uh, several stories about Columbia that are up on the, on the global website. So I'm gonna give you a quick case study about how we can look at this data. First of all, there's Obama, and then there's our brand challenge in the US, uh, Donald Trump. Have you ever heard of Donald Trump? Has yeah. anybody heard of him? Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So one of the problems with the American uh, public is we have this very, very stereotypical image of Mexico. All right? We're very uneducated about Mexico. We think of Mexico as beaches and pleasant people, but we have these outdated uh, portraits that get played up by a guy like, like Trump. And so, you know, he's, he's been good at creating some public relations nightmares. But behind the data, what we have seen is that even before Trump showed up, in our BAE data, Mexico as a brand had been declining over time in the eyes of the American consumer. And the reason for that was is that people had what we call negative knowledge. It means I know what I know about Mexico, and I don't need to know anything more. The problem is there's a whole lot more in reality that people need to know. They just need to open up their ears. The issue here is that they think with Mexico and our data compared to all other countries, and this is now global data, that people think Mexico is friendly. They think it's got incredible you know, assets, but when you look at what it performs worst on is on education, on corruption, and on this overall sense of sort of safety. When that happens, people become concerned and they don't want to invest or go to Mexico for tourism. So what we did is we looked at our data to say, well, who are the people that would be most likely open to a new discussion about Mexico? And we could see that they would be the elites, the opinion leaders and business people. But even they have a bad relationship with Mexico. In fact, in our data, 81% of the elites said that they believed that Mexico was a, a country run by drug cartels, even though at the same time, they said Mexico is a critical trading partner to the US. Now this is what I mean by these outdated attitudes. We as marketers, what do we do? We want to change the conversation. So when I said I was coming down to Colombia, you know what everyone said to me in the office? They said, oh, it's supposed to be a beautiful country. Great food, great people. Have you seen Narcos? Right? This is the issue. How do we change these perceptions? And you're going to see this in the global data in just a second. So let's look at how Columbia performed. When we look overall at the data, we can see that the perceptions, just like Mexico, lag the reality of what's happening here. So overall, we can see that Colombia ranks uh, 49th out of the 60 countries, and in large part that is because in the data they didn't know much more about Colombia than its beauty, and in terms of its people and its culture. So it did not perform too strongly on those important measures I talked about, global citizenship, cares for its people, and innovation. Now we see across the data, the other place that we performed the best on was on adventure and beauty where we ranked 28 overall. But there's some opportunity. And the opportunity starts to come when we start to look at some of the things that have become increasingly important to people around the world. Best countries for retirement, Colombia does a little bit better. But this issue of transparency, we call it glass nations. The, Colombia is not yet seen as an open, transparent country in the perceptions of people around the world. Then we see Best countries for women, this became incredibly important in our data. Countries that were leading in gender equality, such as Canada, the Nordic countries, they did very well, as well as Denmark. Colombia, not yet. And the same with being seen as progressive. So these are things that we want to start to work on if we're going to build our brand and drive investment and tourism. Now, what we did is we thought about the negative knowledge with Colombia. So in the BAE model, just thinking of the country as a brand, it's not yet well known by a lot of people. 
around the world. So that's our opportunity. People know more about Brazil, they know more about Mexico. Colombia for them is a little bit of a blank canvas waiting to be explained. So that's something we should talk about. So let's talk about Colombia's brand image. These are the image attributes that people around the world associate with Colombia. Now, the first thing they see most associated is they think Colombia is sexy. They think it has cheap manufacturing costs, pleasant climate, affordable, not bureaucratic, happy, religious, different, strong military, and unapproachable. In our BAE data, every time we see unapproachable, that always means I don't know what it is. I don't know it, so I don't really necessarily know if I feel connected to it. So on the least associated is not corrupt. So they're concerned that it might be corrupt. Again, remember they don't know much about it, but they are starting to make these surface assessments. They think it's individualistic, has many cultural attractions, has a rich history, skilled labor, uh, well-developed infrastructure, a lot of nice things that should be associated are the things that are not yet associated with Colombia. So what you start to see is there's this sexy, sort of dangerous, slightly dangerous personality that people sort of see in the brand that I would suggest there may be ways for us to leverage. Um, so we looked at our data, this is quantitative data, and people around the world think Colombia is most similar to Shakira and most different from Sergio. He is a mathematician from your country, he has a PhD in mathematics, and he's not seen as closely associated to the country. So how do we build in that sense of innovation, that sense of progressiveness? Now the good news, Colombia is seen as very sexy like Vogue, very fashionable, very cool. It's not like Fortune, it's not like a traditional business magazine. And it's seen like a Ferrari rather than a Chrysler, which is good, right? So. We went a little bit deeper and we said, okay, let's look at our BAV brand comparisons to see how you compare against other countries um, in the region. And you guys will have to help me with some of these. You'll know them better than me. But um, Columbia, the brand, first of all, is most known uh, with your famous uh, soccer star, Mario Bazpedi. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Americans are just figuring out football. Columbia, rather, sorry. So what's interesting about him is he's, you know, successful, sexy, cool, he's also been a little bit erratic, right? A little dangerous. So the other brands you're most known with are brands like Snapchat, Harley, Diesel, Axe, and Monster Energy Drink. So there's this sense of sort of vibrancy, action, you know, danger and intrigue. Brazil is the sexy thing with Red Bull and Tinder and Ducati motorcycles. Argentina is a little more um, less known or a little bit more broad. It's seen as Gap and Pepsi. Chile is less well known around the world. Seven Up and Honda. And then Mexico kind of has this inclusive imagery, right? With Fanta and Pinterest instead of uh, Tinder or Snapchat. So these are just some of the associations that we see in the, in the data. And we then started to think about, okay, if these are the perceptions, who has the realities of Colombia that might be different? And what's interesting is that luxury travelers, people that have traveled or very well traveled, have a far different uh, vision of Colombia than they do of the normal uh, broader population. So among luxury travelers, tourism, they rank it at 28. Uh, they rank it at eight, rather, compared to 28. So they see it as an incredibly fantastic place to visit. They also think that Columbia is really different, really more special and more unique. In fact, it's a 95% level of uniqueness in our data. So it suggests that the people that have been here, that have been to the restaurants and been to all the amazing things that, that Columbia is about, have a far more sophisticated view of the country, as you would expect. They also see it as stronger on a couple of those other measures that we said was so important. Not only do they see it in terms of its beauty and adventure, but they see it as more powerful, more influential, and they see it having stronger quality of life. 
So that's a real big question. How do we build this bridge from the country out to the rest of the world so that you get more people starting to experience what they don't know? Because when you look at the dimensions comparing luxury travelers to the broader global audience, you can see that the rankings change dramatically. We become seen as far more affordable, far more fun, far more open in terms of travel, better on climate, better on safety, and better on scenic. So people are beginning to understand the difference that Columbia makes. We also see that Columbia was ranked number six in Latin America for adventure travel and number 24th all over the world. So this sense of sort of sexy danger, injury, mystery, is there something here that we can also use to really lean into positioning the country in a way that creates this sense of adventure? That is also potentially a, a huge opportunity. And then I think there's a real interesting opportunity to leverage adventure travel moving forward. So you can see, despite being considered, at this point, a more dangerous country, adventure travelers are still flocking to Columbia. They're still seeing it in terms of being a very interesting place for adventure travel and trying to navigate their own issues around the issue of safety. So let's get in and kind of talk a little bit about some of the implications. One of the last opportunities is about sustainability. Interesting that Columbia is, in our data, number sixth in the world for least amount of carbon emissions. That's a perception, a perception of green Columbia. So as the previous speaker was talking about, you know, world-class green brands, brands like Tom's and Warby Parker, is there a way to position Columbia around sustainability in a way that could create some interesting dynamics of showing what it's really all about? So, I guess I wanted to step back for a second, and this is where I move from data that I understand to ideas that start to become just some early thoughts for you to consider. And I think the first one is we've seen that people have an intrigue with the country, but they don't know enough about it. So how do you export your culture, and how do you tell the story of Columbia Cool and you guys will find better ones than I found, but this is us in New York. <laughs> you know, but I mean, number one is, how do you think about Medellin in, in, in an Art Basel kind of way? How do you think about talking to Gen Z and millennials and people that are really into art and culture in a way that can create a cultural pool? Clearly, you have amazing restaurants uh, all over the country, but from Harry on to all these other amazing chefs, is there a way to continue to export that? Mexico has done that very successfully in New York, for example, where you're getting a sense of the culture through the restaurant and dining experience. You know, coffee, how do you think about single origin coffee, which is starting to be covered by, by our press uh, in the United States? And then I mentioned earlier this concept of feminine values. Um, actually, with my co-author, Michael D'Antonio, we wrote a book called the Athena Doctrine, that looked at the rise of feminine values in leadership, the rise of empathy, selflessness, collaboration, this concept of soft power. And we interviewed um, some really interesting people in Colombia. We interviewed uh, Mauricio Facio Lince, who was in the, the Medellin municipality, and he talked about how they were designating nearly 50% of the municipal budget towards people under 35, to try to create new sense of, of education and opportunity for young people. We also spent time with Catalina Coduque, part of the, the Misangre, my blood foundation, and she has been working to repatriate FARC rebel soldiers through what she called empathy camps. We spent uh, an entire two days with her at one of these camps and understood the incredible work that she and many other women are doing um, all over the country. And then we also spent time with Margarita Bernal, who's uh, at the EDU and was part of the Metro Cable project. You know, the idea of understanding how you can connect the favelas to the vibrant city to create more opportunity. So if I just took those three stories, those are stories about innovation, 
Those are stories about caring for people. And those are definitely stories about global citizenship. How do you show this progress to the world? How do you get out and tell these stories? And I think that's really where we should think about this opportunity, is we have clearly the opportunity around culture and arts. We have it around sustainability. We have an opportunity to, to clearly take the brand imagery of being sexy and finding ways to lean into that, building on the mystery and intrigue. And then you have this opportunity with luxury travelers, high net worth people that know more about the country than most others. But I think I want to step back and think for a second this summer about Brexit, right? There was a choice that was made for the UK that will have lasting ramifications on its future. And October 2nd, you're going to be making a huge choice. You're going to be making a choice about whether you become inclusive, whether you forgive, whether you think forward into the future. I'm not making a political statement. I'm more saying as a researcher, this is a really pivotal moment in your country and a pivotal moment in your brand. There could be an amazing opportunity to um, opening up this amazing culture and telling the story of brand Columbia to the world in a way that moves it forward. So with that, that's a little bit of the data. Uh, we do strategy work uh, in government and, and in the enterprise and with companies. But I thought I might do, that'd be more important, is have a little bit of a brief discussion. Uh, any questions around the data and then any ideas you guys have, if you're advertising people, you're smart creative people, how would you brand the country? open up the floor for discussion. Thank you. Yo, yo arranco con la primera. ¿Te estás oyendo o lo hablo en inglés? I'll listen. Go yeah. ahead, please. That's my name. Okay, so, so I think my first question, um, just by listening to, to all of this, and uh, uh, personally, I, I manage uh, a very, very Colombian friend, Aguila. And then my question would be, most of the people here are not involved with Colombian brands, but we are all involved with brands from Colombia. So what would be a good way to take some of your, your, your um, suggestions uh, for Colombia brand, for our brands to actually start building on that Colombia brand story that you, you, you talked about? Yeah. So what, what, how can we as brands actually help build that brand? Well, I think the first thing is that um, if you think about many global brands, they will take what's called provenance, where they come from, and they'll lean into that to shape their brand imagery. If you think of the new Jaguar campaign, it's very much focused on classic Britishness and how they've built this sense of mystery and intrigue and sort of James Bond uh, into their brand. So I would, and we'll send the presentation, but I'd look at those attributes that people already associate the country with and see if there are some interesting ways that you can position your brands. There's some great attributes, you know, sexy and daring and, and cool. And you know, those are the, uh, just a few of the types that, of, of different opportunities, I think, that, that you can use to, uh, to position the brand. The other thing we can do in BAB is we can mash together your brand and your country and see how they're different or how they're alike. Because some brands are very, very different from the countries they come from, and some are, are very similar. So sometimes your country's association is an opportunity, sometimes it isn't. But um, you know, many in cases, cars, automotive, um, they tend to be opportunities to, to really link your brands to your country. Questions, anyone? Comentarios? Yeah, I mean, 
number one, we just had our um, the Global Citizen Festival in New York, um, which is just a, become a huge, huge event. And I think there would need to be some sort of an amazing event that brought the culture and world political leaders, world opinion leaders into Colombia to mark the, the start of a new chapter in this country. And I think Cuba is contemplating those types of those types of things. I think that would just send such a huge, amazing signal that you can then also have people come and experience all the amazing things that are Columbia about, that Columbia's about, and then also start to dismiss some of the things that are their stereotypes that may maybe keep their investment out or stop their tourism. So some sort of a magnificent event, I think, would be incredible. Um, we could do that through the advertising agencies. We could arrange you know, a WPP stream, but we could do it with all the holding companies to create some amazing creative event that could bring music and culture and arts and entertainment here. I think that would be super important. The other things are really more about reaching out and starting to tell the story, whether through more invigorated consumerism, uh, I'm sorry, tourism campaigns, um, starting to use social in a huge way. I love this idea of exporting all of your, your cultural um, capital taking all these amazing chefs and authors and architects and getting their stories out. I don't know if the government does that, if your country's websites and your social platforms are really strong, but we've seen a lot of countries do a really great job on their social. Um, Canada, check out what Canada is doing with social. It's really interesting. Uh, and then beyond that, I think it's just getting clearer the positioning of the country in the minds of, of people to probably the brands, you know, getting more of the Colombian brands um, into the marketplaces that matter, whether it's the US, UK, China, you know, places that are more important. It's back to that slide I showed you where they, we have a really good understanding of Brazil, because we see it all the time, we just don't yet know enough about them. I want to know your thoughts. What did you guys think of the data? Does it, did you go, the data makes sense to me? Does it make sense? Were you surprised? John, there's a question over here. Oh, sorry. Do you recommend that we should like to maintain the same positioning with the external investigation? The brand? I mean, because I've seen in the past, you know, with the company of brand, so we have tried to have like an internal positioning, even the one that we want to do. But I think that it's very interesting to see or to have some examples from growth. Yeah. What, what's the best? I, I think you need one positioning, and the best thing would be if there's a, an outcome that you support that creates unity in October. To some extent, there's unity. Um, what do you do to really take a single position and make that forward? So you think about Incredible India, you know, as sort of the country positioning that they try to use in other places. But then also, that was back to my point about getting the politicians involved getting them to see how important they are as marketers. Prime Minister Trudeau turned around the image of Canada almost within a year, right? I mean, he now needs things behind him because he won't stay that popular that long. We know in politics, right? But he's created this new narrative for Canada, at least in the United States, that people go, Canada's cool. Canada cares about global issues. Canada is taking in immigrants. Canada is place that I want to be. So I'd say one position. Yes? Would you say that more than a country brand perception, or wrong perception, is a more a Latin brand perception for you guys? Totally. It, totally. It's, that's why you saw a I lot that's of people. That's <laughs> No, it's, it's stereotypes. <laughs> exactly. But that's the opportunity to differentiate. In BAB, we break, look at brands that break away, right? So we have insurance in insurance category, and then we have Geico, very different brand image. So if, if all the brands are seen the same, in marketing, that's an opportunity.
Absolutely agree with that point. And if you saw the previous um, speaker, she talked about the importance of cultural values inside companies, right? We know the guys at Tom's, they have strong cultures, and so people buy in to what that company stands for. Your corporations, similar to the question that was asked earlier, should be part of this new narrative for Columbia. You know, how do you take um, innovation, progressive things that you do it inside your companies and export those and tell those stories? But listen guys, this is a really pivotal moment and now just my personal view on, on this is you guys have a chance to do something different, to not do Brexit. You have a chance to actually be more inclusive and more opening. And I think that's the challenge right now. In my own country, where you have this hate, we have these borders, everybody's trying to close things down right at the moment that you guys can come and become a beacon for being more progressive. Yes, it's in your businesses, but if you look at my data, and I'll stop, if you look at our data, Nordic countries, Canada, they created impressions very quickly by being inclusive, by being open, and being welcoming. I think that's your guys' opportunity, is that if this vote ends up going that way, there could be great opportunities for you to really rise in the data. Thank you very much.